So like I mentioned before, our tosses are event-driven. Every task waits for an event to occur, and then a task, uh, an event occurs typically from a what's called a kernel-aware interrupt. So an interrupt service routine that is aware that about the existence of a kernel or, in other words, an RTOS. So uh, a timer expires, generates an interrupt, signals a task, wake, wakes up the task. A DMA transfer completes, an Ethernet packets arrive, a packet arrives. So each one of those events cause an interrupt service routine to fire, which then signals the RTOS that, hey, maybe a task is waiting for this event to have occurred. And Mr. RTOS, go ahead and decide which task is the most important task ready to run. Also, it's possible for data to be available or a signal to be done from another task. So the task may say, hey, I got something um, I have available for a task. Here it is. And by the way, the RTOS will decide whether or not that's the most important task to run. So an ISR task could signal another task through a semaphore, through event flags, and I'll explain those. So a mutex is released, like I mentioned before. So I'll get into that as well. So a kernel-aware interrupt uh, are events. Kernel-aware interrupts are events. So oftentimes, interrupts are events that tasks are waiting for. So interrupts are more important than tasks. It's a hardware feature. It has nothing to do with the RTOS, unless the RTOS decide or the application code decides to disable interrupts or prevent interrupts from happening. So kernel-aware ISRs are, are, are basically, they need to notify the RTOS of the entry of an ISR as well as the exit uh, from an ISR. And this allows uh, for nesting of ISRs to avoid multiple scheduling. So this is what happens. So the low priority task gets, well, a task gets interrupted. If an interrupt fires, we notify the kernel, hey, I'm at level one of, of an interrupt service routine. And as I'm executing an interrupt service routine and, and I re-enabled interrupts, then another interrupt comes in before I have time to complete. The same thing happens there. I'm actually entering the uh, interrupt service routine. I'm in the process of signaling a task. Another event occurs, another interrupt occurs. I'm entering the third level of interrupt service routine, signal the task that's waiting for, for this interrupt to occur, exit, decrement a counter saying I'm at level three, now I'm gonna go down to level two. Level two interrupt completes basically decrements the same counter. It says, okay, I'm going from level two to level one interrupt. And then I execute level one interrupt service routine exactly where we left off where while, when we were interrupted. And at the end of that level one interrupt, then we basically decrement that counter to zero. And at that point we say, oh, the counter is zero. We're going back to task level code. We're done servicing all interrupts. And what happens there is the RTOS gets involved and says, okay, now, out of all these three interrupts, is there a more important task than the task that was executing? Is there a more important task that is now ready or wait, was waiting for this task, for this uh, one of these three events to occur? And if the answer is yes, then that task gets the CPU. We do a context switch. We restore the CPU registers of the new task, and we just leave the CPU registers of the other task sitting on the stack of that other task. Or if none of these three events is more important than the task that was currently running, at that point, the, the exit from the ISR of the level one will go back to execute that task because it's still the most important task to execute. Now, the other thing we have here is a task can also generate an event. So a high priority task generate or task generates an event for a low priority task, of course, because it's low priority, the RTOS will not switch to that task. It will continue executing until that task decides, okay, I'm going to wait for my high priority event to occur again. And until that happens, then I'm going to switch. I'm going to tell the kernel that I'm done execute. I'm waiting for my event. The low priority or lower priority task gets to execute. And the same similar scenario, a low priority task executes. I generate an event for that high priority task. There's a context which that happens because the high priority task is more important than the low priority one. And thus, we cannot continue executing the low priority task until that event that I generated for the high priority task uh, is being processed by that high priority task. 
All right, so that's that's events generated from tasks, not just from ISRs. So there's also on the certain processors provide you the capability of having multiple levels of interrupts. So uh, an interrupt level zero, uh, for example, will will interrupt a level a level uh, two, a, a, a level zero will interrupt the level one, level one will interrupt level two and so on. So what happens is in that case, it, it is possible that you have some extremely critical uh, real-time events that you need to handle. In that case, you do not want to get the RTOS involved. You say, as soon as I get that interrupt, I will process that interrupt in place and then return. I don't care where I was, whenever that happens, I have to serve that service that immediately. For example, you may be updating a PWM timer and all you need is the value of what you need to update the timer with. You don't need to tell the RTOS to actually do that through a task. You could do all that through an interrupt. So having the overhead of notifying the kernel and then signaling a task and then exiting the ISR and then telling the kernel, okay, go ahead and determine if there's a more important task. Well, there isn't because this is a non-kernel aware interrupt. It's an interrupt that needs to be serviced in place. And one of the benefits of that is has zero interrupt response time. So in order of priority, of course, there's a reset. Uh, in, in the case of, uh, I'm using a Cortex M processor in this case, there's a reset, the non-maskable non interrupt, hard fault, uh, ISR level zero, level two. So I basically, by convention, by programmer uh, decree, I decided that these two levels, zero and 20 hex, because that's the way it works on the Cortex, zero and 20 hex, is what I'm going to allocate myself to non-kernel where ISRs. All the other interrupt levels, I'm going to actually make them kernel aware, meaning that if an interrupt that is programmed to happen at level 40 hex is generated by some hardware peripheral, some, some device, at that point, that interrupt needs to actually invoke the kernel to tell it that an ISR is starting. It needs to signal a task waiting for the event and it needs to exit through the RTOS as opposed to just servicing in place. So these are kernel aware versus non-kernel aware. So priorities from a kernel perspective, uh, at least the Microsoft OS 3, the kernel priority zero means the most important priority N minus one is the lowest uh, priority. And then you could actually decide how many priority, priority levels you want for the kernel. So uh, I'll get into that as well. So the, the, a, lot, a lot of times people think the tick interrupt, which is one of the interrupt sources that a kernel typically manages, and in fact, the, the tick interrupt is not actually totally always necessary. It's there to provide course uh, time delays and timeout. By course, I mean, if you're setting your tick rate at one millisecond, it doesn't guarantee that your events will be executed exactly every millisecond. It, it will do its best to handle your events within a one millisecond, millisecond re resolution, but there's no guarantee that those events will be handled exactly on time. Specifically, if there's, there's a high priority event that is waiting for time to expire based on this clock tick or system tick, then that event will occur first. And then if there's a second event or second task that needs to run based on time to expire, and they both expired at the same time, then that will actually execute after the higher priority task. There's only one CPU, there's only one thing it could do at any given time. So again, the system tick is used to provide course delays and timeouts or timeouts on wait for events. So you may say, I'm gonna wait for an ethernet packet to arrive, but if nothing happens within a certain amount of time, I want to be notified so that I take corrective action. I was expecting Ethernet packets to come in. They're no longer coming in. Maybe something happened to the line. Maybe I lost the internet connection or whatever it was. So I say here, a system tick is not mandatory. If you don't need time delays or timeouts on calls, then you could remove it. However, don't ever make a system call that specifies a specific amount of time to time out. Because of course that specific amount of time will never occur if you don't have a system tick that is generating these regular intervals. 
Um, also, there are some uh, changes in the industry. A lot of RTOSs are now using what's called dynamic RTOS tick, and that's done specifically because of the way it's implemented. So instead of waking up the CPU and the RTOS every millisecond, then there's some intelligence in the RTOS that basically says, if I only need to wake up in five millisecond, I will actually set my hardware timer to give me an interrupt in five millisecond. At that point, I will process the, the time. <coughs> Same thing if there's no events that are waiting for time for a whole 17 millisecond, then the RTOS will be awoken only in 17 millisecond and decide what to do at that point. So that dynamic RTOS tick is one of the features that you see in, in RTOSs these days.